I'm Michael Govan, Director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, here uh, to uh, hear from Mr. John Baldessari, who is one of the um, great artists, not only of Southern California, um, but certainly of the world. And given his height, he's easy to pick out in a crowd. You see him everywhere. I think he's one of the most um, generous artists with his time and his presence around the world at events where I've seen him over many, many years. And that generosity of spirit uh, marks his career as, as much as his uh, brilliance in art making. He was born in the famous National City, California, and he um, attended schools, uh, university and schools, mainly in Southern California and also in Berkeley. Uh, and then he taught at the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia from 70 to 88, and then at UCLA from 1996 till just recently, 2007. And for an artist who once counseled his students to go to New York, uh, he sure, certainly stayed in Southern California a very long time, and we we're much better for that. Um, his work has been shown around the world. The list is too long of places to name where he's uh, been shown, but his work also, um, as you probably know, is not just uh, painting and sculpture or whatever we'll call this work and talk about it, but books, films, videos, billboards, public works. Um, he has, again, too many honors to list, but uh, included in those are the American Academy of Arts and Letters and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And maybe to just say most recently uh, in that long list that in 2009, just this last summer, he won the Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement at the Venice Biennale. So that was and was also named Artists of the Year of the American Friends of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art just recently, also this year. So, and he continues to be a vital figure. He's received also many honorary degrees from um, uh, many places. And uh, more importantly, I should mention what he's doing here at LACMA and has done. Uh, you've seen his work here in the collection and exhibitions over time. Um, most uh, recently, I had the very fortunate opportunity to call upon his creative genius to help us when I first came to LACMA uh, and was working with uh, our curator Stephanie Barron on her project Mag Mag Magritte and Contemporary Art and we sat there and thought we could come up with an idea to give it a real um, spirit and we uh, called John Baldessari and asked him to help us with this exhibition and you most of you probably saw the extraordinary results I'll show some pictures later for those of you who didn't but the uh, carpet of blue sky and clouds and the ceiling of LA freeways um, was, was a big hit as well as the way he organized that exhibition. Uh, he has also been called on by other museums like the Hirshhorn recently to think about curating. He began in art history, which we can talk about too, but um, even more importantly for me at that time, I was able to invite him to work with us to uh, design what ended up being the design of our new logo and image. Um, and when I came to uh, the museum, I had promised to bring artists into not only to show their work, but to think about how they could help shape creatively the frame of the museum, and he's done that as well. Um, and then upcoming is his retrospective, uh, which is uh, about to open in London, uh, John Baldessari, Pure Beauty. Uh, the co-curator for that show who's here at LACMA is Leslie Jones, who's here tonight. Um, and that exhibition opens at the Tate Modern in London and travels then to Barcelona before coming to LACMA on uh, June 27th, June 27th to September 12th, 2010. Mark your calendars. It's going to be a great event that will be in the uh, Broad Contemporary Art Museum. And then the show will end at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, an appropriate honor for this great artist. Uh, please welcome John Baldessari. I put this slide up of a painting uh, appropriately titled Pure Beauty. And uh, this is also the cover of the upcoming catalog, which we'll be selling to you later. <laughs> um, it was actually an interesting argument with the publishers about whether this was a good or obscure and difficult title for a book and a cover in terms of its sales potential. And of course, I couldn't imagine anything better, like who wouldn't want a book on their coffee table that was pure beauty. Um, I encountered these works, word paintings from the 60s when I was going to school and um, 
high school, college, and university in the late 70s and early 80s. And I remember coming upon these word paintings um, as I was studying art history and training to be an artist myself and being dumbfounded and amazed by these incredibly simple, powerful works. I think they were so powerful it had something to do with me giving up my own art at some point because how could you do better than that? <laughs> and I think there's something just to get into the content of it that, um, you know, one of the legacies for me of the 20th century of not just art but philosophy, psychoanalysis, um, is this kind of greater awareness we have of context and this interest that we've developed, especially the 60s were like this, when it wasn't just what was depicted, it was how something had a meaning, how something was made, what was the structure it, of it, what was underneath language. And um, even trying to be an artist myself at that time, it seemed pretty clear that you, you just couldn't paint a picture. It was not possible. And, and somehow your picture had to have an awareness of its own making and what it was doing as well as being something in and of itself. And somehow these paintings for me um, did that entirely and uh, were, uh, were certainly pure beauty in and of themselves. Let me just, uh, maybe to start conversation, this is another one of those word paintings. Um, can you all read that? <laughs> and probably couldn't think of a prettier picture, a more beautiful picture of, than this. And I'm curious, John, what, you know, what kind of images, how were these paintings inspired um, in that sense? <coughs> well, uh, it seemed to me that um, people read, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> it might be the language of the realm, you know, rather than uh, visuality looking at paintings. I, I, I think at this point I decided to switch to text and photography, figuring that you know, people did look at books and magazines, and that may be a way to communicate. So that's one reason I began using text and text and photo. Uh, and then um, uh, the idea of just saying something, but not having it be visual, I thought was sort of interesting. Uh, and you could almost, I think I could make a convincing argument that uh, art, uh, one way you could define art is a, that it's a convincing lie. Uh, that you have to convince somebody uh, but, but, uh, what it is you're doing. I mean, even a conventional painter, uh, if the viewer is not convinced, and then, then all it is is stretch a bar and canvas and paint. It's not much. But, you know, you have to, you know, win the audience over that, you know, what you're doing is more than that. Um, I began to be very much interested in film, and this is uh, a lift, uh, one scene uh, from D.W. Griffith's uh, 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 script for Intolerance. And I liked it because it, it talks uh, about a short segment of time, uh, and it's a, and, and a very simple gesture, very beautiful. I don't even know, you want to, yeah, no, I'm sure some painter could paint this as well. But it, it seems so beautiful, this re having it described and imagining what this very simple gesture. Could be, yeah. I mean, just to talk about beauty for a second, I, I mean, a, a lot of people will talk about this work and they'll talk about it as conceptual art is the tagline for it. Um, and of course, for those of you who don't know, these paintings are made are not made by you. Uh, no. they're, they're made by a sign painter, and the text in this case is taken from somewhere else. So you were questioning, in fact, that notion of what creativity is. Because well, like, yeah, and I also decided that, um, that canvas and stretcher bars certainly w w was a signal that it was art. And, and you wouldn't even have to, that's plenty, anything you did on it. Was art. It was art, yeah. Right. yeah it was yeah, art, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what's so interesting to me is then again how it returns is that uh, you take away what you think of the normal hallmarks of beauty or painting in that sense, other than the simple sign that it's art. Um, and then it comes back at you the other way that this is a, for me, of course, these things are really beautiful. Well, and then if you define painting as, let's say, paint on canvas, that's what this is. It's paint right. on canvas. So then where is the argument about wh right. what painting is? <laughs> well, and you realize, of course, if, you, if, if the text comes from somewhere, if it's not painted by your hand, then the nature of what art is is not those things. It must be something else. It becomes very troubling. <laughs> <laughs> well, which gets you to this. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> 
um, which was always one of my very favorite paintings. It was hanging in the, I borrowed it for the opening of the Broad Contemporary Art mm. Museum. Um, very zen. <laughs> Opens up the field uh, for consideration, that space. And uh, not to maybe talk about the content of this work as much, but I know there was a moment when Joseph Kosuth, another famous conceptual artist from New York, uh, complained that your work was, um, what had, was funny and it had humor in it and that wasn't really appropriate for art. Um, and I think he responded something about, well, it's not humor, it's, it's something else. And, and, and for me, it was always something else. It was, I don't know what you call it, it's a kind of irony, it's an awareness, it's an openness. Um, it's not quite humor. No, it's not. I, I, I've always said that if uh, I was trying to do humorous art, you know, it would be completely different. Uh, I, I don't know what it would be, but it wouldn't <laughs> be this. <laughs> well, and tell me, do you think there's a, I mean, I, in that Kosuth comment coming from New York, and there's a lot of this when you think about the New York, Southern California aesthetics about black and white or color, but also this, I thought about it in that way of humor is not allowed either from a New York perspective. Do you think there's a bit of Southern California ease that allows for a larger definition? You know, well, I, I have an argument there um, that um, I'm always, not always, but quite often, you know, I'm the California conceptual artist and I, or uh, the California artist, and it's this, this always this idea that California is some strange place. <laughs> <laughs> They're weirder uh, out there. Uh, and, you know, you never hear the, you know, the New York artists or the New York conceptual artists. You know, I mean, they're in some special place and everything else is a province. Uh, so, uh, uh, and it's true, we are lotus eaters, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and speaking of New York and how art is made, this is another one of those mm. Word paintings. This, you'll see this is, of course, the didactic introduction to the lecture with all this text paintings, and of course you don't need any other words with these, but um, you were also interested in taking fragments of text that would have been, that are part of uh, the critics or art historians, and actually thinking, you know, laying bare, in fact, those ideas of art historians or critics and just putting it right on the surface. And I know you were actually studying, you were you were partly an art historian for a while. Well, I, was, I, I had ideas about doing that. And then? <laughs> I decided against it. <laughs> art's more fun, making yeah, the art's yeah, more fun. Exactly. Um, and and I, you know, again, these are I get the trade of this uh, rhetoric that is there, and you identifying Clement Greenberg, of course, this gargantuan critic figure that really made New York art. Well, I think also what's, uh, what obtains here, too, is that you know, art has to endure. It, if it just dies right away, it's not so interesting. It, you know, it's, it, the, if it has a life, uh, then it's probably not so bad. Uh, but I think also critical statements, you know, to see how they hold up is also equally interesting. That's right. Now, uh -huh. How well does it hold up? You know, we'll, we'll see. Well, and even then, I guess you were aware that there's more than one perspective, and you played yes, with that, right? Yeah. Well, one story I never told you about this, I, I entered w w way back in some, it was this, it's called Artists of Los Angeles in, in the vicinity, it was, and it was at the old, when it was down Exposition Park, right. and they were bringing in some big name person, the jury, and, and Clement, Berg, Clement Greenberg was the jury one time, and I entered this. <laughs> <laughs> And? It, it wasn't in the show. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I could do that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's not art, I could do yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but of course, they also have their face value. They are what they are, their perspective, yeah. an option. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, of course, this was not that you never did just one of these. You would also have uh, different perspectives. And this was always one of my favorites since Kubler, who was a hero of mine, but one, obviously, you have the Greenberg's sense of that uh, immediacy of the formal presentation of art and its immediate meaning and feeling through perception and sensation. And of course, you've got this other school of thought about thinking about the complexity of yeah, how meaning is built. the continuum, too, you know, yeah, exactly. This painting <laughs> is so fantastic. It's the painting that never stops giving or growing. <laughs> it's growing, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can read, if everybody can read the left side, but just to, be, to let you know, so the left panel of this painting, 
uh, was shown first by itself. Um, no need to describe when and where, since it's clearly written. And maybe you can tell us how this idea evolved, because it also ends up that this painting, annotated, will be in the show upcoming. Yeah, I, the idea came uh, by reading so many accounts of documentation of a work and the work itself getting lost and separated. And I said, easy problem. You just make the documentation and the work of art the same. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, you know, the documentation will never be lost because it is it's, the work. It is yeah. the work. Yeah. You can't lose it. <laughs> so if everybody hasn't sort of figured it out in that sense, so every time the painting is shown, uh, a sign painter is asked to include the current venue and the dates. So it keeps growing. So it keeps growing and it keeps growing and you'll see it when it arrives at LACMA again, uh, that it has grown to include our own venue. So it, it, it keeps going and going. In fact, Don did a beautiful uh, work for the, for the uh, hardcover book, which actually includes that growing painting that connects it to our own exhibition. But there is a sort of weird existentialism too about it, that it's there, it's being there, it's there in the place, it marks its own <laughs> presence, right? Yeah, it, it's troubling. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about the that's troubling. That's going to be my word for tonight, troubling. <laughs> So when you showed this painting, did everybody else think it was troubling? I don't know what people thought. You know, I mean, uh, uh, originally these things, you know, I was giving them to friends, and now they've attained some, you know, currency. Um, right. Literally and financially. <laughs> <laughs> now they're hard fought over yeah, yeah. Uh, and difficult to get. Um, another perennial favorite. We've so sold more refrigerator magnets of this painting. <laughs> Then you can imagine it was made for the, we did it when it, the Magritte show was on and then it was featured in the um, road exhibition. <laughs> yeah, well, this was lifted from some throwaway magazine in an art supply store uh, and uh, you know, I, I lifted it. But you know, how, how taste changes, you know, this is literally true now. I mean, it is literally it, true it's now, right? into the mainstream. <laughs> yeah. It's actually, you know, Jeff Kuhn said it's one of his, my favorite works well, of his. Well, I have to tell you, I, I very, when we did the installation of the Broad Building, I wanted to make sure it was in clear view of all of Jeff's work, um, kind of to ask that question. Right, and, right. and again, um, I have to say I love these also because I, I guess you did, but collecting, love to collect uh, books about how to make paintings, right. things that were instructional, right? It seemed, because what is it about that language that makes it seem so step by step and so easy that we're attracted to. Well, I love the idea that people really think that art can be taught, and I, I just I think these are great to read. You do this, you do this, you do this, and then you've got art. Right. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it is, and but it, but it, of course it is. It's also the it is the pure beauty of that language. Something that there is something about the way those instructional manuals. Yeah, at least, well, they're not, they're a little easier than, you know, Ikea manuals. <laughs> <laughs> right, about how to put something together, yeah. you can tell. Yeah. And obviously these are true and untrue. They get you to think about these issues. This um, is one of our absolute iconic works of our collection. Um, and uh, this was also in the um, opening at the Broad Museum and will be featured in the retrospective. Uh, the gentleman who bought this for LACMA, Maurice Tuckman, is actually here tonight, I think, and was telling me that it, uh, you bought it for what? For $600 out of your discretionary fund. Is that the right story? I don't know where he is. Is that, can we verify that? True. <laughs> it's one of our um, most important paintings in the collection, and these are the series of works that you made with word and image, these photo emulsion images that you didn't fuss over, Right, they were simple black and white, they were, and then you juxtaposed a word. And of course, beneath all those words that we were looking at were images or ideas of images. Um, and I guess, uh, I mean, it's pretty clear here with what you see going on, but I know that this comes from, and I sense that because I used to collect those too, some kind of photo, those photo manuals, like used to come with your Kodak film that would tell you how to or not to compose a composition. <laughs> And you don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I, and then, and the idea of wrong. Um, I had another uh, instructional book, and this guy would would make little thumbnail sketches of scenes, and 
one, one depiction would be the right composition, but then it, the next one would be the wrong, wrong one. composition. I mean, you're exactly. supposed to learn that way. But all the wrong ones, I thought they were, were the, the, they were the right <laughs> ones. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I like the idea of you just say something's wrong and it's wrong. Right. Uh, and then recently there was a, oh, there's a book out about uh, like, uh, digital ma manipulation of photographs. You know, years back it used to be airbrushing. And I guess it was in the New York Times, I don't know where, but uh, then they showed some examples of, of manipulation of photographs. And there's that famous one from Kent State, you know, where the woman's down and, you know, screaming or whatever. And the original photograph had a lamppost coming out of her head. And, the and they airbrushed that out because it would, you know, it would look strange. And ruin the wrong. composition, <laughs> right. Wrong. But here you've uh, yeah. Yeah. nailed yourself to the palm tree, which is, I assume, in your neighborhood right outside your... It's a real palm tree. That's a real palm tree. And, you know, the point is really well made and as simply and beautifully as you can. It is wrong is right, uh, or, you know, you, you do see this, and it's a fantastic composition with its centrality. It's almost symmetrical. It's pure beauty. Yeah, I once had an idea, and I guess maybe this comes from teaching too much, that I'd have two rubber stamps, one would say wrong and the other would say right. And, uh, and then when I could, you know, criticize paintings, I would stamp all the right sections and all the things that weren't so good, I would stamp wrong. wrong sections. And then I'd just move on to the next student. <laughs> so, and this does get us, I guess, to that question of the kind of arbitrary nature of these distinctions, right? That. Uh, Creativity and what's wrong or right is a contextual yeah. issue, right? Yeah, yeah. Always. Um, I do think that, and to now play the word games backwards, um, you were working with words on canvas, you're working with word and image to play that backwards, and of course, here you have pure image, and this is an early work. Well, this is when I was a painter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a painting. I actually painted this. <laughs> With your hand? Yeah. <laughs> and this is the one With brushes? This is one of the ones that got away because most of those yeah. paintings you destroyed yeah. in 1970. Yeah, well, right? my sister had this. Uh, but uh, yeah, I actually had a brush in my hand and oil paint. And yeah, it's painting on canvas. <laughs> you want to give us the title? Uh, God Knows. <laughs> God Knows. which seems beautifully obvious and does work in many ways. But here you were painting and you're already obsessed with language. Yeah, well, yeah I'm pretty bad with language. Yeah, yeah, I've always been fascinated with reading the language and words, absolutely, sure. Yeah. This and image, of course, shows up again and again, I think also in your most recent work, we'll see one at the end, but the cloud in the sky. Yeah. What is it with that? What I've done, you know, with Gemini, I've done a God Knows. It's, 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 it's sculptural, and it's, it's mounted on the ceiling, you know, so you have to look up to see it, and it's God's nose looking down at you through the clouds. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, when I had my retrospective in, in Vienna, uh, some of these early paintings were there, and I thought, well, I should get back to those subjects again of, of, of body parts. There was one of a nose, one of an ear, one of a forehead, and so on. So I, yeah, in this last few years I've been going back and reinvestigating those ideas again, of no, and noses, elbows, knees, foreheads. Right. I mean, yeah. interesting to me that you've specifically not done many eyes, which is, of course, the favorite of the surrealists playing with... Yeah, but well, that's too easy. That's right, it's too easy. And right? lips are too easy. <laughs> right, lips and eyes were the surrealists, and yeah, you picked what was yeah, left yeah, over. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite works. We'll see something like it again. It's interesting to me also how you would, um, it's like any art gesture, not just historical art gestures, but you were able to twist and turn things being made right away. And of course, in the 60s, there was an interest in work in the landscape, right? And interest a lot in mapping. Um, and this, again, was one of my favorite works. And it's probably hard for all of you to see. This is a work that goes with the text. Those photographs, the smaller ones, goes with this map and a text. And the text describes exactly what's going on. So it's very matter of fact in terms of how this was made. You see a map of California. Um, and then I guess where each of those letters of the word California, the C, the A, the L, uh, you went to that spot on the map and then made an image of that letter. Of that letter, 
So if you can make out, I don't know if I have a. Well, point they're all you know. Some are large, some are small, right. and they're all there's each one of different materials. And yeah, there's an yeah. A, there's an L. Yeah. <laughs> but you can you know sort of. I, I think my favorite one is the I guess is the top one. Uh, the, this one. The, the, the second from the, the right. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, a, a power pole, uh, and the actual. Sh yeah, that's for the letter L, but the, the shadow, the actual shadow goes off to the left. That's a fake shadow coming out. I did, <laughs> I did with lamp black. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, I think it, it is amazing. You, you, you know, this idea of mapping, marking the letters, the language, you had, uh, it, it's an, there's an incredible versatility in, in ways. Um, I mean, I don't know if you plan to make an entire career out of being able to mine language in its multifaceted forms, but it seems like you never ever got tired of it. Well, language is so arbitrary. I mean, we, you know, the well, classic example would be like a tree and the word T R E E, and then a, a sojourner, let's say. And, but in another culture, it would be another word for tree. Uh, but if you show a tree, uh, it's Probably going to people will have different words for it, but it's still going to be tree. Uh, so the idea of image and text has always been fascinating to me, and I could never decide what was more one, one were more important than the other. And I think I think my answer has been they're equally important. A word, a word tree is as equally interesting to me as an image of a tree, right. and and I, then I play with that slippage. Right. Uh, between the two. And this, I was telling Michael earlier that this, the genesis for this piece uh, came out of a, a word that's very uh, specific. Defenestration means, means throwing something out of the window. You know, how often do you get to use that word? Uh, not too often. <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, so I just decided to throw something out of a window. Uh, and I thought it should be as unnatural as possible and, and, uh, and interested in color and color sequence at the time. So you get the whole uh, chromatic scale of you know, red, going, <coughs> red going through orange, yellow, uh, green, uh, blue, violet. And so that accounts for the number of images. And it would be very unlikely that anybody would sh throw a big sh sheet of colored cardboard out of a window. Uh, and it's, it's also, a, a, you know, it's a very formless exercise as well. And I, I told Michael er, earlier that I consider myself a closet formalist, <laughs> that I am at heart, but I don't want to admit it. Uh, well, you know, again, that gets us back to that question about conceptual art and quotations and beauty and that question of formalism, because, I mean, I run across these images, and what's always true is that it's never a one-liner or a one-worder, that every time you compose one of these images, it seems like you have seven different things you're doing at once. So defenestration and you're throwing something out of the window, you're taking an active form of a word and enacting it. Of course, you've got an interest here in color. So you're actually creating um, a, a kind of a color chart or going through the system of color, which gives you, I guess, a framework for how many times to do it and how yeah. big the work is, right? Yeah. And then you have a... Yeah, I a, suppose if it was really a colorful Mediterranean color house, it would be gray cardboard I was throwing out. <laughs> <laughs> right, so then you, uh, you have black yeah, and white and yeah, color going. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I read this image, you've got that going. Of course, you've got the beauty of seriality in and of itself, mm -hmm. which is multiplicity. You can have one thing constant, which is the image of the house, and then one thing changing, which for me is even almost a, a kind of musical, formal, compositional structure. Yeah, and the rectangle, too, is not placed there. It's just that moment, that incident is taken. So it you has get that, chance. Yeah, you know, chance, yeah. You have the chance operation, mm -hmm. and I guess... Um, I mean, I'm not sure if this is true, I'm just reading this a bit. There's also, there's the chance of where it ends up, but it seems as if one is trying to throw it in a kind of controlled way that would be consistent almost to block the frame of the window so you have something between the intention of where it's the color is supposed to go and where it ends up as part of that chance. Exactly. So it has, uh, I mean, a work like this for me, again, has so many openings, so many options, so many ways to view it, and I guess, I think of the slippage between the image and text for you is, is partly, that's the space that we inhabit as the reader or the viewer, right? Yeah, and another thing I think that informs my work, and I think of any good artist, is that it should look incredibly simple. Right. But as any artist will tell you, art is not simple. simple. Not right. at all. Well, and this but it's is very hard, very difficult to make it look simple. <laughs> right. 
which is the beauty of this work and these kinds of things for me as well. The simplicity is uh, stunning, and yet the many ways of reading it and looking at it. Um, this is another piece I love, in this, a little bit in the same vein, where um, you see the, uh, the smoke, and there's a cloud outside. And of course, I read this as trying to make the same smoke as the cloud, which is, of course, a, a kind of physical impossibility. But you get the endless repetition of trying, which is I, metaphor is a bad word, but it is the plight of the artist uh, trying. Um, works a little like a film strip, too, but it doesn't imply time. Uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, isn't it, it's something about that same space between word and image that is similar to the space between the thing intended and the thing out there. There's some missing space. Yeah, I, 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 I think I was taking a lot of photographs of clouds at the time, and then you know, I was in a period in, in my work, I guess I would describe it, what would happen if. Yeah. Uh, and um, so I said, okay, uh, I wonder, you know, I was smoking, smoking cigars at the time, and I said, I wonder, on a roll of 36, you know, 30 film, 35 millimeter film, if I could uh, capture a cloud of smoke that looks like that image, and if I, if at all, and if I could, how many might I get? And that determines the number of them, uh, and uh, a lot of rejects, of course. And that, that it might even occur at all is so far flung. But right. I said, well, let's give it a try. And I think, I think art comes out of failure. And uh, just you know, say, well, let's see what happens. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, that's exactly art does come out of failure. And for me, this is a. It's one of the most beautiful descriptions of that process of making art, of being an artist, of trying, of the intentionality, of the beauty that lurks there in the cloud, yeah. of the problem of getting there, of getting that image. Yeah. Well, my, uh, Bruce Nomino once said a great thing that, and I do, I do this. I'm, a, you know, I go, I'm in my studio every day, and I don't wait for inspiration. And the idea of being there is mm -hmm. that, yeah, I mean, you're not going to be inspired necessarily, but you. You, you, maybe, as Bruce said, maybe you're going to sweep the studio floor, and he, of course he's done some sweeping pieces. But the thing is, <laughs> That's art. Um, at, at a certain point, you're going to get bored, and then creativity comes out of boredom. Right. And, and so like this, you know, like this, you say, God, I'm, just, I'm bored. Let me try this. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We won't subject you all to the piece of I will yeah. not make any more boring yeah, art really. written over and over again. Yeah. But there is something. Uh, to that for sure. And I, I guess also, isn't, it, uh, isn't there something about those early pieces, those instructions for making art? In this case, you've set yourself a frame of instructions for the piece, right? You've, you've in a way taken well, a loop, creativity a loop, a loop, a loop out of it. Well, parameters, that's Parameters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But isn't that true? But when you set the parameters, and of course you can never determine the result. It's always no. yeah. something unexpected. And the, and the, and the genius, or, or genius, I'm, I'm sorry to use that word, but uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 Strike that from the record. Not, <laughs> with a small g, uh, and and uh, uh, is having the parameters not so tight that it's going to be predictable, right. but not so loose that it can be all over. You know, That's right. So, yeah. And that is part of the process of being an artist: is that you have to control the world into a set of parameters within which you work. Yeah. That is part of the creative process, right? Not too There's tight, be not too room. loose. Wiggle room. Wiggle room. Yeah. So you heard that first here, the creative process and wiggle room. This is, again, speaking of pure beauty, this is one of my absolute favorite pieces, which is a series of prints where uh, it's, I forget how many of the best, and we're only showing two of several of the results of trying to throw three balls into the air to make a line. Again, it's on the 36 exposure roll. 36 exposure roll, right. But not all 36 are in it. It's the no, ones that are the most all. successful. No, 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 yeah. So you see a kind of horizontal line there, and then you see a vertical line here. And again, some of those themes come through. You are a formalist, and you do see visual themes coming through about the sky. The circles show up again and again, that geometry, which we'll see back and forth. Well, and brevity and simplicity, too. Right. Yes, yeah, simplicity, mm -hmm. which is there, and that space of uh, trying. And um, one of my personal favorites as a curator was this piece. This is, uh, again, among a, a many series. We're only showing three here. And this is, um, this is called, what is it called? It's called Choice Game for Two Players. Cho choosing. Choosing Game for Two Players, Carrots. Yes. <laughs> um, 
And you set up, in each case, three carrots and then quickly... Well, I mean, um, there'd be two people involved in the camera uh, looking straight down on, on the plane, uh, picture plane. Uh, and then a pile of carrots, and somebody would, the other person would put out three carrots, and then for whatever reasons I would have at the moment, almost like Clement Greenberg, I would decide one of them was better than the, the other, other three. <laughs> Uh, I don't think he had this in mind. <laughs> but this is how things get interpreted. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, I might be hungry, I might have liked the color, you know, all kinds of reasons. Uh, but I would, uh, I, would, I would be forced to choose one. Uh, because that's the game. Uh, and then, uh, then that chosen carry would, would remain, uh, and the other two would be removed, and another two would be added, and then I would have to keep on playing the game. And at a certain point, it, the game stops because John is bored. <laughs> John is bored at the end of the game. But in a way, again, for me, if the smoke piece is a little about that process of the artist, this is, of course, made in honor of the curator. Um, and that sense of choice and choosing and aesthetics and what is best and what's not. And of course, you can't help but think of that moment when curators will, or we walk into the room and you'll look at pictures and say, that's a good picture and that's you know, not a good I, picture. And I think I got the idea of, you know, shopping. You know, I'm a fast shopper. Carrots, okay, pile of carrots, tomatoes, pile of tomatoes. But then I would notice shopper would be picking up a carrot and looking at it and turning it over and putting it, putting it, <laughs> looking at it. And I said, it's just like art. Yeah, it's just like yeah, art, right? Yeah. You know, people <laughs> do that with chocolates, but, you know, carrots? Right. Uh, so I decided to... Right. Well, it. isn't it, it's also about that inherent somehow in human nature is that sense of choosing, One of is better than discerning, the other. Yeah, right? Exactly. So we can yeah. say that the process of art, not yeah. only of making and creating, but the process of choosing, discerning, thinking about, selecting, yeah. Yeah. it's not arbitrary. No. Um, there's some series of mechanisms that we use, and here you're putting it in practice. Yeah, I remember a Ben Well film where they, 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 I don't know, they walk, couples walking out, and there's a whole column, a uh, row of col co columns, a colonnade, I guess you call it, right? And, and uh, I yeah. think he's saying that they're all the same, and she's saying, no, they're all different, look. Right, they're all the same, no, they're yeah. all different. Yeah. And obviously, yeah. both is true. I think for me, again, that's part of the, one of the great aspects of work like this is that it does leave a lot of options or openings and it, and it does, I mean for me it always taught me that whatever situation you're in there are always many options, many openings that aren't quite arbitrary. Um, well it's actually two ways of looking at the world, things that are alike or things that are different. Right. And you're going to get a different answer each time you, you, right. you use that one Suppose frame it. or the other. Right. So you're a formalist and you're a philosopher. We know those two things. Um, and here, you're hidden. This is just another, I think, just to show the agility of some of the, the ways of looking at seriality and work. And just a few images here where, um, obviously, the figure here is obscured with the hat, this kind of geometric circle that uh, obscures the face, which shows up later. Um, and to speak again about, it seems so many of your works go back to also looking, somehow getting inspiration from time to time from film. I was just thinking now I should have done it with pies. <laughs> <laughs> the next one. The next one. Yeah. This does come from yeah. film too, right? It's partly well, inspired, you know, those, a little you back know, and you know, forth. The, you know, the, the gangsters coming out of court and hiding their face or their right. hat. And I'm sure. Right. And it's also been compared to that beautiful yeah. Buster Keaton scene yeah. with all the different hats tried on. But there's something to the obscuring the face and making what should be a portrait frame into something hidden. Yeah, and then it's such an anachronism, like who wears hats anymore, right. you know? <laughs> only detectives in 40s films. <laughs> Sydney, you want to stand I up said, now? sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's always an that exception. <laughs> <laughs> I put this in for you. Um, and again, to speak of artifice, now you were, I mean, you rarely do deal with portraiture, but you did, in this case, look at self-portraiture and you manipulated these images. These are all manipulated, yeah. yeah. Um, which I do think in Hollywood terms, too, of makeup or, you know, changing one well, thing. Well, yeah, I, I said, told Michael earlier there was a German dealer I had. I, I, I really wanted to look, you know, have him be made up to look like him. And I actually went to Maurice. And he lined me up, or gave me names of some Hollywood makeup artists, but it just seemed too complicated, and I abandoned it. But this is what came, came out. Right. You just did it on with yeah. the photographs. Um, 
I couldn't help show this work, which I love, um, which is mid-70s, and it's, uh, these are images kind of of ice cubes, I guess. And if, I don't know if any of you can look closely enough, but if you just meditate for a minute, you'll realize there's a message, and it is uh, by Baldessari. No, you, you by Baldessari. You by, yes, this is a you by, by Baldessari. <laughs> so you get this subliminal message. This was shown at Sonnenbend Gallery, right? Was this one of the first ones? I think Sonnenbend, yeah. 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 Um, and again, for me, this is everything you saw, you would turn into an artwork or thinking about it. I think of this moment when a lot of artists who were making conceptual work or these kinds of works that nobody wanted, and all of a sudden, there was a market for them, a bit. Um, and there was this issue well, of... Like, I got a great story with a series of works uh, in the Sonnenbend Gallery. I, I, one, I, I was trying to get really banal things. So I just did a picture of a block of wood, you know, like two by four or something like that. And it, but but airbrush wor wor words into them, and you could barely see them. And Ileana told me she had this very difficult collector. She was showing them this and this, and it's no, 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 no. And then Ileana had this piece of the wood block in her office. You, what's that? And I like that. And explain it to me. Well, I, I had airbrushed into it S E X. And <laughs> uh, and and and, and Ileana was... told her, said, "Oh, I'm not interested in that at all." And walked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> it is interesting, also, how this work has been co-opted into. The market, and it is—I mean, is this that expression of desire? Just to move on for a second and look at—I want to look at just some, also some other interesting compositional strategies. One of the most amazing compositional strategies that you've used and deployed, in part from film, and we'll look at other things, is this idea of montage. But of course, you also use photography mm. to do something which is and isn't montage. Well, well, more importantly, you know, we're, we're talking about instruction art, it's instructional books on art, and do this, do that. You'll have art, and uh, I had a painting instructor once tell, told me compositionally you should either have two things apart or they should overlap, but they should just never be abutting. And he <laughs> called that kissing, and that was not good. So I took them literally. <laughs> you know. Kissing the palm tree. So you know, she's, she's not overlapping, they're not apart, and she's literally kissing this palm tree, which sets up a, a spatial place, so it puts them in the in one hand, in the same picture plane, right. but they aren't at all. Yeah. Right. It is a kind of anti-montage, yeah, a weird yeah, montage yeah. in real space. This was the runner-up for the LACMA logo image. <laughs> 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 or a montage, again, in this sense, where you see the, I don't know if you can see the, the comp composition made of these two. Um, uh, I do love this image as well. It's darkness of black and white, uh, the kind of sense of the film still, the sense of... Well, it, it, it's, it, again, it's purely about composition. You know, we were talking about Byzantine art, you know, in Byzantine there's just one person, another person in a row, and then as you get into the Renaissance art, they're all convoluted and so on. So I decided to, you know, that's from a movie still, to pull this couple apart, one the guy with the gun, one the guy with his arms up, and just have them show them separately. Uh, and it's very simple, you know, you just airbrush one figure out <laughs> and, and we photograph. And we, uh, we put in some lines there for background. Um, but, uh, and then I had an assistant of mine who, who was working for me at the time. She said, I just walked in here to your studio and I saw the perfect example of this work, which I'm walking down the street and this woman standing there talking. And so I thought she looked like she was talking to herself. As I got by, went by, there was a fence there, and she realized that she was, the woman was talking to another person on the other side of the fence. But <laughs> they, they were a couple, but they were separated. But they were separated yeah, by the fence. Yeah, well, yeah. and of course, you get this, once you've picked the image apart, rather than pasting it together as montage, you get these striking figures, which yeah. have a quality that many other artists, as we were talking about, yeah. seized upon this idea of removal of image, and then you get this striking uh, composition of this one figure looking surprised, or the other. Yeah pointing at nothing, and of course, new the, meaning the, the, is made. The, the, yeah, exactly. Um, just speaking of compositional, I mean, you became a master of these compositional plays. Um, and this is just another uh, example. This is um, where I think everybody can read this, but it's divided in two, uh, left to right, and then three, top to bottom. And so you have this under the sea image, this horizon image, and the sky image, as simple as it could be. You have an airplane and a 
bird, you have these figures in the boat, and then this uh, mermaid figure. And of course, there are about 6,000 ways to try to read this as ordered well, as Well, this it actually is. came out of structuralist you know, philosophy of you know, a diachronic and centronic time. So if you read in the column, on the, you know, the three on the left, and the three on the right, if you read them, uh, if you read them vertically, uh, then they're synchronous in time that uh, I'm trying to get you to believe that this airplane is in the sky at that time and that two men submarines at that same, similar moment. And the, the middle shot, it's a speedboat coming in at the left, uh, and then over here it's going out at the right. Uh, so uh, in the period of time when that speedboat enters the frame and leaves the frame, that this magical transformation is happening, the airplane's changing to a bird and the submarine's changing to a mermaid. Right. Well, it all, you know, art's a convincing lie. Do That's I right. convince anybody with this? Probably not, but I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and again, just to go back to that idea of beauty and composition and mm -hmm. taking something that's sort of conceptually framed in a rigid grid and speaks of time and has that, and yet, I mean, it's incredibly poetic. I think so, yeah, and I really do like it. Beautiful in that traditional sense as well. Um, a work much talked about and seen, and I didn't for you, although we talked about flipping this the other way. This is called Horizontal Men of 1984, and um, if you can all see the Horizontal Men, which all come from, again, film stills, right? You were collecting film stills at this point, mm -hmm. buying them, collecting them, categorizing them, and then reconstructing them into these compositions, and if everybody can see, this man, of course, is walking with the ground this way, and... Um, there's another work you made, and, uh, and you talked about that kind of, uh, that very scary image, of, that Holocaust image of bodies, stacked corpses, stacked yeah. corpses mm -hmm. from which this seems to relate. And I'm not showing that image, but there's some of that feeling that comes through even in the... Well, and also the motivation for this is that when they're images of guys, uh, they're always upright, and I decided to make them a little bit more vulnerable. <laughs> exactly. Um, just in the interest of time, let me, uh, I want to move to uh, some of the other photo images and uses of photo collage, which has become something that you've, the manipulation of photography and new means has been something you've relied on a lot. And here's an image that you made uh, that was actually shown in, a, in public, right, in a billboard between two intersections. It's called Man and Woman with Bridge. Um, and as you were saying, it actually fit the site. The site was very important. Yeah. Pictorially. Yeah. <laughs> You want me to talk about it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, this was in Minneapolis, and there were several artists involved in this project of doing billboards. And I thought, you know, they, they picked the sites, but I thought the sites were brilliant. Uh, 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 so this one is on in the intersection, but on the two, two opposite corners, there were two pickup bars. And, and this is lighted up at night, and you can be in the bar, and you get a look at this. And then, uh, and then they had a piece by Barbara Kruger, who was down in the porn film district. <laughs> and I thought they were great, you know, uh, marriages. You, know. um, you, you were collecting these film stills, and of course, you had told me that you know the two images, I guess, that show up the most. Yeah, guns and, and kissing. And therefore, they do show up in your in, in your work a lot in these these photo collages, and are again quite spectacular and poetic and formally constructed and full of options. And uh, uh, seem to you seem to play with this a lot. Again, uh, again to talk about John the formalist, um, you did get bored with the rectangle. Yeah, you know, uh, for, I never noticed, uh, you know, the, thought about much about the convention of the square or the rectangle when I was like, when I was a painter, because you painted you canvases or, you know, some proportion of you know, height to width, the you know, square or rectangle, whatever. Uh, and then when I start picking up a camera, I, I, I notice how forced it was, you know, that the, 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 uh, the viewfinder is a certain height-width relationship. Uh, the photographic paper is a certain height-width relationship. And, you know, the rebellious person that I am, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't deal with that, so uh, I had a, my camera to have a ground glass in it, and I would drop in a mask, a triangle mask, or a, a circle mask, or, or a long rectangle mask, and I would compose within that. And, uh, yeah, and this, this is this, called... Yeah, this is to get away from the convention of the rectangular square. 
which you do. And then John, the formalist, you see how it's kind of neatly composed in a kind of a symmetry um, and not. It's called black and white decision. Um, you see two, just enough information to, to see a chessboard with two missing players to ask that question about the black and white, the back and forth. Chess is, of course, chance, I guess. In yeah, a, and I like to you know, think that you know, in all cases, the, guy, you know, the, the bad or the good guy in the white horse, it's ambiguous here. Black outfit, white horse. So, <laughs> uh, but in the, you know, making a chess move and the, and these you know figures that you know, do we come out? What do we do? It's all about making a decision. Make, right. And then you know, in a bad pun, black and white decision. Right. Um, you use that. You've become almost baroque, I think, in your photo collage images somehow. And you've even used baroque frames or ornate frames to play with that idea, uh, creating these multiple compositions where you, I guess, collage images within and up within themselves. Uh, you see the circles show up, which we saw in the hat. And I guess you started putting these circles in a way to disrupt the well, they, portraiture. You know, well, yeah. So you're not looking at the face; you're looking at you know everything else. You know, right. but the face is so important that you're going to usually ignore the, you know, all the ambience. Uh, right. uh, so this is trying to get you to reprioritize the way you look. And of course, you get to use your primary colors, <laughs> plus green, depending on which color system you're using. And I love the way you would actually, the frame which you think of as containing or holding the whole is defining its perimeter. Here in this becomes the line that connects a narrative or something together. So it's the opposite, it's the inside rather than yeah, the outside. Yeah, it's frames talking about frames. Exactly. Um, or here, your ability, the title of this one, I, this, is, uh, your, this is the jogger. Oh, yes, here you have the, of course, Santa Monica scene with the palm trees. And then you have the... Um, Buck Rogers. Buck Rogers spaceship. <laughs> and then this beautiful space where they intersect, yeah. which is a kind of a painting. So here you are painting a little. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I admit it. I like painting. <laughs> <laughs> Got that on tape, everybody. <laughs> or some more recent work where I know you've come back to that word image play uh, that goes right, takes us right back to the beginning of the ambiguity, potential ambiguity yeah, of the yeah. word image slippage, which again gives the viewer, I think, a space to play looking at it. Um, um, or this one, which I love, recent work, <laughs> where I guess you've picked color fragments from these, color these chart. Are the, these are the, the actual colors. That is Perky <laughs> Peach, that is Link, according to catalogs. You've made a meal of colors yes, for us. Yes, I have. Yeah, <laughs> a feast for the eyes. And then you found yourself going back to that nose. Yeah. This is the back of the image of the catalog. Um, and of course, you've elaborated in some of what you can't tell about these works is they're also three-dimensional. So yeah. you, you've come out into sculpture to play with sculpture, that these are wood cutouts that are painted they with exist on three collage. planes, the picture plane and a, a plane above the picture plane, a plane below the picture plane. So they're low relief, I guess That's right, say. low yeah. relief. It's, yeah, it's painting again, composition, Caravaggio, there you have it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so to conclude, I just want to just to bring us back to LACMA. You see the big photo, uh, this big image that belongs to the Broad Collection, which has been upstairs uh, in the Broad Building for all that time. And you see some of these themes. You see the guns. You see the kisses. You see, I love how the apple becomes sculpture in this environment, um, this juxtaposition of images on this billboard scale. And in this case, it's a billboard that's been brought inside to that scale. Uh, it seems almost cinematic in its uh, frame. Um, and it looks pretty fantastic up there. So all of you can see this now, and it will stay up for, for a while, and then I think be part of the, will be there for the retrospective as well. Um, and again, I said, and I'm not sure everybody does know, that our new LACMA logo, it came from a conversation, well, from John's work. And it was a collaboration with, uh, it ended up, this part of the logo ended up with, as a collaboration with 2 by 4 Design. But the story is that uh, I wanted to rebrand LACMA. Every new director wants to come in and rebrand the museum. And, you know, out with the old, in with the new, let's think of a new image. And, you know, the conundrum of LACMA and those five letters, and it's been tried before, and I looked through all the design work, and again, so we commissioned another five designers to take a crack at LACMA, um, which was kind of a total failure. And, you know, we were all excited we were going to get some new things, nothing. So I remember Dejected calling John, because we had been working on the Marguerite Show, and I said, can you take a crack at this? Will you at least just look at the problem for me? Um, and... Uh, I think two days later, you said you weren't sure. Two days later, you came back with, you brought me down to the studio to see this photo collage where you had taken um, 
a photograph that you had from the 60s that was used for a poster for another show of this palm tree with the thumb and the, the uh, pencil, as if the artist, of course, is there measuring. Um, and uh, this picture where you see, of course, most of the picture is sky. Sky again, common theme. This is a black and white image. And somehow, it's so obvious. Of course, it spoke to art or artist in LA. Right, the palm tree, and of course this displacement of size, this question of scale, this question of possibilities for me, of you know, is it big, is it small, it's all relative, but it's not arbitrary. And you did the simplest thing, you took a red pencil and you underlined the L and the A. And I was astonished at the simplicity after 30 designers um, had taken a crack at this. <laughs> And come up, came up with take the C out, make it llama. You know, here it is upside down, extend it out, multiple typefaces. And her, it, was, it was like a few days later, and you just came back and said, "What do you think?" And you just underlined the L and the A. And of course, it was L A. Um, and it was made it again your formalist side, perfectly symmetrical. So the C became symmetrical, and everybody wanted to underline L A. The first two, the L A here, because that meant Los Angeles. Uh, and here it was ambiguous and suggestive. It was Los Angeles as L, it was A as art, or it was simply LA. And I have to say, I brought it back to the staff and we were all astounded with the clarity and the simplicity of this gesture, which now graces our coffee mugs. And, uh, no pants. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, I, now, I never gave out business cards before, but this is our business card now, so I can give out a little piece of art to everyone. And maybe just to end, before we ask some, answer some questions, oh yes, and then I gave you the daunting problem of Renzo's building, uh, and, and you came back, again, it didn't take long, you came back with an image, which we're going to re-show again without the text uh, for, for the retrospective, of this image updated. <laughs> um, and again, it dealt with the simplest problem. Here was a building that was symmetrical. You couldn't put the same image on both sides of the building, that would be redundant, um, and yet you made it a question, both you rephotographed it in color to bring it into the presence, and of course, that beautiful image of the, uh, uh, the iPhone or the phone there, I guess, is the modern pencil. Pretty much, yeah. 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 You reconsidered the Magritte and Contemporary Art Show, as Stephanie and I had invited you to do that, because we were focusing on this painting of the famous Magritte, This Is Not a Pipe. And I mean, I think this is memorable for all of you who, who uh, were at the show, but um, I think the most interesting, here you have the cutout, which comes from a Magritte painting, uh, where you did the door. It, you, it was centered on the, the uh, pipe painting down this long perspective, and you could get a hint of the... Yeah, I think one of the, one of the great ideas was that such an iconic painting of the pipe, pipe, how far could you have it away before it wasn't iconic? Right. So we, we decided to see it all, you know, the, the whole shot. The whole you can still see it. It's, that's right. It's Magritte. And of course, wildly beautiful and simple solution because uh, everything could hang on the wall. The space was entirely disrupted. It was upside down. It was Los Angeles with the freeways, the LA freeways uh, on the ceiling. Uh, and all of these works looked amazing in this space. Uh, I remember the, Je I don't know if we have a picture of the Jeff Koons lifeboat sitting on the, the heavy uh, bronze lifeboat sitting on the clouds. And of course, your work was also featured in the, uh, in the exhibition, and we had already, Stephanie had already selected you within the exhibition. A funny story about this is we did consider, because we had so many requests for those, that cloud carpet and the ceiling, and you know, couldn't we just sell that? And I didn't even talk to John yet. We had the Magritte estate was working with us for all the product design. And they said, no, 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 you can't do that. The clouds are copyrighted. You'd have to pay us a royalty. And of course, this true story is that you had designed the ceiling and the floor for another well, project. Yeah, yeah, with Rem Coolhouse. Yeah, <laughs> with yeah. Rem Coolhouse for downtown. Yeah. <laughs> and had just appropriated this. But this was the greatest compliment on earth, that the Magritte Foundation had actually appropriated this work of yours that came from another source. I love that you can copyright a cloud. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to copyright it based on Magritte's common love of clouds, which you share. Well, the thing is, you believed them. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, since I knew that came from the Rem Coolhouse project, we had this little argument with them, and we both decided, in fact, it was better than commercializing it, that we would hold it at LACMA. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It was such a good idea um, after the show that 
and of course you had done the column, the plays with space, making a room, an inside of a room outside, playing with Magritte's paintings. Uh, it totally brought the show to life. Um, you had Via Selman's comb kind of leaning against in this space, which was taken out of a Magritte painting, and you painted the outside of this simple box with a perspex sival inside. How much fun was that, right? I had a great time. <laughs> Uh, and it was a huge success. And of course, now we actually own that piece as a piece, the ceiling and the floor. Um, and it's in our boardroom, so our board sits on clouds with the world upside down. And it's also in my office, uh, which we were in today. And I could not have imagined, John, a greater gift uh, to the museum, uh, to me when I arrived in LA, to, for this space, this gesture of turning the world upside down in LA for a kind of fresh start, a way of thinking uh, newly and all of that. So I really. Thank you for that. Thank you, Michael. Um, so thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.